Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Hey, last week in anti-counterfeiting raids across the world, Interpol arrested 6,000 people and seized 133 million worth of fake goods. Not one of those arrested, however, was a central banker who had conjured up fictional national wealth by fiddling with QE buttons on a quantitative keyboard. Nor were any of those arrested spoof trading high-frequency algo bots generating fake liquidity with very real front-running. No banker or broker trafficking in bogus derivatives backed by delusional collateral. No naked short-selling silver manipulator and not a single robo-signing mortgage forger. Nor a fake LIBOR rate giving banker was seized by Interpol. No, it appears Interpol made the world safe from 133 million in fake shampoo but failed to spot the trillions in sham financial transactions destabilizing global labor, currency, and bond and equity markets. Ha ha! Now, we, let's get some more on this. Stacy. <laughs> well, Max, we know financial regulators apparently refuse to do anything about all those fake derivatives and bogus transactions happening globally, but I thought maybe Interpol might be someone we could, uh, you know, appeal to to arrest all these fake derivative wielders. Interpol operations net millions of fake goods, so they netted tens of million dollars in fake shampoo, phony cigarettes and turkey, and bogus booze in Chile. And Interpol said the reason why they did this is it's about quality and expectations. You're buying a particular electrical component part, you have trust because it's a brand you know and respect. But that product could, in fact, be dangerous or defective. It's misusing trust of the brands. Counterfeiting is uh, an interesting concept in this context in that you have central banks who are counterfeiting uh, money that's not uncollateralized by any economic uh, activity or savings. There's no savings in the world. America doesn't save money. Britain doesn't save money. There's no collateral. There's no basis for having an economy with banks offering loans based on collateral. There is no collateral. It's all counterfeit money. Trillions of dollars worth of counterfeit money, which destabilizes the economy to such a degree that you end up with people having to sell junk as shampoo. Whether in China, they're selling, uh, remember famously, the uh, pork stuffed cardboard <laughs> buns as food, uh, chicken feet coming out of their yin yangs as food. Uh, that's a result of the counterfeiting at the central bank level. So, yes, I take your point that $133 million of fake shampoo is the result of $160 trillion in counterfeit cash from Bernanke and this new fellow in Canada, the hockey puck to the head, Mark Carney, etc. Of course, one of the things from uh, China, you also had the melamine and the milk, which killed a lot of babies. And you also had the, the fake... Uh, uh, building products, so houses were falling apart. So the foundations of these houses were falling apart, and of course, who laid the foundations of this global uh, fraudulent financial system but Larry Summers? And he's in the news, he's one of the people in the running for Treasury Secretary, that, uh, not Treasury Secretary, but the head of the Federal Reserve Bank to replace Ben Bernanke. He's one of the few names. Larry Summers' billion dollar bad bet at Harvard they're referring to him now as the Cambridge whale, which is uh, fitting today as we have a new royal baby of Cambridge. <laughs> oh, really? A new royal baby? Well, yeah, I read all about her on Frankie Boyle's tweet stream. He doesn't seem that it's going to add any value to the UK economy, according to Frankie Boyle. By the way, look at this photo of him. This is uh, him looking much like the Duchess of Cambridge before she That's went That's a photo of the baby? My God, they, these kids, they're obese. What do they feed these kids? The, that duchess should be ashamed of herself. Look at that fat baby. Oh, my God. How did she pass that through her little you? Oh, my. Woo-hoo. Wow, that must have hurt, baby. Wow, wow. Well, no, that, that was Larry Summers, Max. Oh, that's Larry Summers. And this billion-dollar bad bet was that during the financial crisis, Harvard lost nearly $1 billion because of some unusual and ill-judged interest rate swaps that Summers implemented in the early 2000s during the troubled tenure as the university's president. So what he had done, Max, 
is he had uh, thrown his lot behind some fake derivatives, basically. The, the same sort of derivatives that have blown up Greece, Italy, Jefferson County, Alabama, and now Detroit. Interest rate swaps allow borrowers to lock in a fixed interest rate on floating rate debt, which can be good to hedge against short-term uncertainty. The problem with Harvard was that Summers wanted to lock in interest rates for money that the university hadn't actually borrowed and wasn't planning on borrowing for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I remember when people were kidnapped, it used to be a crime story. Like here, Larry <laughs> Summers obviously was kidnapped by banking terrorists and forced to participate in an illegal Ponzi scheme. But that's the cause of celebration. He lost a billion dollars for Harvard's money. Or like as you point out, Grace was kidnapped, Papandreou was kidnapped, and by John Paulson, the hedge fund manager, and uh, Lloyd Blankfein over CEO of Goldman Sachs, put a gun to his head, so either, either accept our credit default swaps or going to blow your freaking head off. He then took a billion dollars, put it in his mother's name. So Larry Summers, he's qualified to be the Fed chairman now because he's shown himself uh, to be easy to extort money, to manipulate, to print, to counterfeit money. He's a serial financial killer. He's the, he's the uh, you know, the Charles Manson of banking. So he's perfect to run the Fed. Of course, when he was uh, in the Clinton White House, he was part of, he was considered one of the biggest brains out there, right? He was the guy who set us on a course, along with Robert Rubin, to deregulate everything. And he was also here, head of, president of Harvard. So a guy who's supposed to be smart. He's a guy who's known to be smart. And yet he engaged in these derivatives that blew up into a disaster. So these are the same things being sold to passive funds across the world that have blown up passive funds and, and nations across the world and cities across the world because they also bought these. These were being sold to unsuspecting investors, and he was a suspecting investor and didn't understand it. How did Detroit's pensions fail so badly? One of the many shocking aspects of the Detroit bankruptcy and there are many, but one of them is how quickly their pensions fell into deficit because they were actually in surplus in uh, 2000. In 2002, 2003, they were still in surplus, and by 2005, they were, there was a huge deficit. And what happened was the, um, the mayor at the time, Kwame Kilpatrick, turned to Wall Street, just like a lot of other <laughs> municipalities. <laughs> <Don't>... <laughs> <laughs> to laugh. <laughs> so in 2005, the city joined many other municipalities mm -hmm. by issuing municipal bonds to fund its pension obligations. While these bonds do no such thing, they simply kick today's liabilities into the future, they have proven to be catnip to borrowers as well as to Wall Street, which earned significant underwriting fees. All right, so it's the Detroit, Jefferson County, Greece. Harvard's endowment. All the, in the UK, there's dozens of businessmen who have been sold these credit default swaps as a way to uh, enhance their bottom lines, knowingly by HSBC, Barclays, Royal Bank of Scotland, and the other Fakakta uh, banking criminality. And they've all exploded in their face. So, yeah, Detroit is America's Gaza, basically. And look for that trend to continue. They're going to wall that city in and just starve everyone to death and try to make a few bucks as a prison operator. Well, speaking of the counterfeiting, however, these are th this was counterfeiting payments to the pension fund because it wasn't real. It was just debt. They were just conjuring up debt, putting it into the pension fund and saying they had met their obligations. But then what happened is they got into a cycle of having to ever go back and repackage and uh, borrow more money from Wall Street accumulating fee after fee. They've paid over $500 million in the last few years in just fees to Wall Street for underwriting these new bonds to pay back the old bonds that they have uh, almost defaulted on. So they're in a cycle of ever winding bad debts. Oh, right. They're like the Wonga. Look, this guy, Larry Summers, should run Wonga in the UK, which is uh, they charge 5,000% interest rate. They're essentially a mafioso-type organization that is a uh, loan shark, but on steroids. They put loan sharks out of business. They, you know, you want to increase jobs in the UK, put the loan sharks back in business and, you know, get rid of Wonga. Or if you want to have some kind of economic activity in America, if you don't want Detroit to be the new Gaza, then don't have Larry Summers run the federal. Oh, wait, you do want Detroit being the new Gaza. You do want apartheid. You do want a pogrom in America. I forgot. You love it. So 
speaking of these counterfeit things, so they were sold a counterfeit good of, a bill of goods because no doubt following Wall Street Council, the city entered into a complex arrangement involving floating rate debt and interest rate swaps for $800 million of new debt. In an opaque Rube Goldberg arrangement that only a banker could love, the deal ostensibly reduced the city's interest rate expenses. In reality, it did not reduce the expenses, just as buying cheap building products do not reduce your expenses in the long run. It actually increased, and it's now the largest line item on their budget, is the interest rate payments and underwriting fees to Wall Street. Yeah, no, the original debenture called it Zyklon B, but uh, instead they went with uh, deferred it's debenture underwritten by Ponzi-esque future payments collateralized by money that will be printed in the future by Larry Summers, who's in the pocket of banksters, and a double-edged butterfly put spread um, in your face, upside down, interest rate sensitive toward the inflation rate discount mechanism that we've got baked into the hedge product <laughs> from Goldman Sachs to create a new Gaza it called Detroit. Uh, very good, bankers. Uh, you succeeded in creating uh, apartheid in America. American apartheid, Goldman Sachs, mwah, you are beautiful. I wouldn't turn Larry Summers upside down. You don't know what might come out. <laughs> Yuck, ill, yuck. But now speaking Larry Summers, he's in the running to be the next Fed chairman, but the, the previous, the, na the current Fed chairman is in the news. Gold futures hiccup indicates demand outpacing supply. So I know you're going to speak to Sandeep Jaitley about backwardation. Gold is in backwardation. It's been in backwardation since January, suggesting that there's a, um, a constriction in supply. People are having a hard time finding supply. Ben Bernanke last week said, Nobody understands gold prices, and I don't really pretend to understand them either. Good, Ben. We're carrying you out on a stretcher. <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> yes, Ben Bernanke, we hear you clearly. Gold is in backwardation, and the gap is growing. We're going to take you out on a stretcher, Ben. You and Larry Summers are going to be in a body bag of finance, figuratively speaking. Uh, well... Larry Summers can't be taken out in a stretcher. He needs a helicopter. He needs to be We're lifted. We're going to take out Derek <laughs> and remove that fat Larry from his house. <laughs> so Guillermo Barba, who is of the new Austrian School of Economics, the same school that Sandeep Jaitley comes from, he is interviewed in this Reuters piece. And he says the actual message of the backwardation is that there is, behind the curtains, a lack of confidence in the fiat monetary system. He then goes on to say... That's why a fall or rise in gold prices is not so relevant anymore. The monetary fire alarm message, courtesy of the relationship between spot and futures prices, is run for your gold. There is a not enough for all. And, and Germany, guess what? No gold for you, schmucks. China, Russia, m much gold. America, <laughs> no gold. All right. Stacey Herbert, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Stay tuned for the second half, a whole lot more. All right, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Hey, time now to turn to Sandeep Jaitley of FiquettaResearch.com. Sandeep, welcome back to thanks, the Kaiser Max. Report. Things are happening. They're hopping in the gold market. The the trend of backwardation, which is uh, a tech, something you rarely see, really, in markets, but is ex being exacerbated. So talk a little bit about, and I understand the London Bullion Market Association is now in a situation where they can't deliver the gold that people want. They, there's panic buying over there at the, at the London Bullion Market Association. Uh, in fact, there's a run, like a bank run. There's a run over there going on. Mm. The Reuters just reported it. Mm. I mean, this is what you've been warning about. Talk about it. Well, you've, you had GoFo become negative over the past uh, few weeks. So that is like the over-the-counter measure of the gold basis. So that wasn't unexpected by us. So you've had GoFo becoming negative, And that's exactly signifying what you're suggesting. Now, gold lease rates, which is the flip side for GoFo going ne negative, going up, you know, is always explained as sort of, you know, miners want to start hedging when the gold price falls, you know, so they wish to borrow gold, they bid up the lease rate, and that moves it into backwardation. You know, frankly, I think that's, that's nonsense. I've met about 15 miners over the past two months, and none of them have said that they're uh, hedging their, their production. 
So the flip side of that is, well, why else would you want to borrow gold? If the miners don't want it, it can only be to satisfy gold-denominated obligations. So you might, have bought what you, you might have bought gold previously, but because you had no intention of actually wanting to take hold of the gold, it can be lent out. It can be lent out forever as far as, as, far as the, 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 the banker is concerned. But when you come along and say you actually want delivery of, of physical gold, you throw the lease books into chaos, basically. And if you haven't go, got enough gold coming in from your lease books, as you need to sort of uh, give up for, for, for the gold obligations, you're going to have a problem. OK, a now problem. let me jump in. Because when, when this happens in the banking industry, in 2008, the credit froze, banks collapsed, Federal Reserve stepped in, other central banks, they printed more money. Mm. Here at the LBMA, you've got to run on the bank, but they can't print more gold. No. So, uh, now, when, when Ben Bernanke, for example, they asked him in testimony, what is gold? Explain gold. You know what gold is. And he put on his face like he had just swallowed uh, a stupid pill. I, I guess he thinks he can fool Congress. But he, he, he actually told Congress that he was a functional, um, he, can, he can't use a lot of these words these days because they're not politically correct anymore. But I don't know what the politically correct word is for so, someone who's mentally incapacitated. Mm. Uh, he, he got away with this he, as if he had just been hit on the head with a frying pan and he's mm. struck an idiot. But he knows that if the price of gold starts ticking higher and people don't want paper, they want physical gold. There's a massive run on these, on these, on these bullion banks. A like, huge right? problem, a real huge problem, because whatever the reason was for the gold price coming down, you know, oh, sorry, whoever did it, you know, it was for a particular reason. But we heard this from Ambro. Ambro couldn't deliver the gold. Yeah. And, of course, Germany wants their gold. Venezuela's taking their gold. So they crashed the gold price yes. using paper. Now when it starts to tick higher, the people out there realize they don't want paper. They want physical gold. So they're making this problem much worse. Well, the idea was with that price collapse was to get people out of the market. So anyone who was a weak hand in the gold market, scare them out of it. Recovery, economic recovery, fiat credit is, is king, you know, and will last forever, you know. So that was the intent. It, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was to say, look, the gold price is crashing, fiat credit is, is king and will survive forever. Now, the problem is that when the gold price did crash, people didn't lose interest, more people became interested. And if you look at the open interest on, on the exchange, on the COMEX exchange, it just shot up after that, which is something I imagine they weren't expecting. You know, so instead of scaring people out of the market, sort of saying, you know, gold is going to 500 or whatever, it got more people interested. OK, so when gold made a move from the high 1700s down to the uh, 1200s or so, the response in the east, eastern hemisphere, was to queue up mm. thousands at a time and a mad scramble for gold. So that's definitely not what they were anticipating. I mean, people around the world watch this show. They know what we're talking about. They know that there's a bonpocalypse baked into the cake. Mm. They know that the only wealth they'll ever have is going to be in gold and silver. All paper is going to be hyperinflated away to zero. So these people, how vulnerable is it, for example, if right now, this week, in the next two weeks, millions, hundreds of millions in China, India, Russia, and these central banks go up and say, give us more physical, give us more physical. How, is HSBC was technically insolvent. Barclays is insolvent. The bullion banks are insolvent, and they would have to declare their insolvency. They couldn't hide it anymore, correct? Yes. Um, it could be um, a case of insolvency if, if people started to do that. It's in their interest to do that. Mm. If you want to get rid of these bad actors, who are ripping people off blind, like mm. HSBC, Barclays, Royal Bank of Scotland. You take physical delivery, like we've been saying for a couple of years. But don't forget, Max, okay, if there's one gold failure, okay, it basically means that fiat is exposed for what it is. You're more likely to see central bank gold coming to the public market to satisfy all of these gold obligations than a default. But they've leased already hundreds yeah. of tons. They can't release. There's a... 
they can rehypothecate their leases. They yep. can re-lease a lease and re-lease and then infinitely lease and lease and lease again. But it, but now we're at a point where there is a, a, a coming some notion of a transparency and these insolvency in HSBC, Royal Bank of Scotland, that are technically insolvent. They do not have an ongoing franchise. It's becoming obvious that people, there's blood in the water. This is my point. There's blood in the water. If these gold vigilantes come in there and start buying physical, they know they can put HSBC on its back. They can short HSBC, buy gold, and make a huge profit. But I, uh, you're going to see gold come out of the woodworks to satisfy obligations, though. Yes, of course, you know, most of the central bank gold is probably on lease. But the gold is, is slowly returning from those leases. But it's never going to return at a rate more, uh, uh, at a quick enough rate, you know, for it to satisfy the obligations. Look at Germany, okay, when they asked for the gold back, okay, they thought that gold was just sitting there in, in wherever, in New York. So to turn around and say, well, you have to have, you can have it back, but it, over a seven year period, well, that's insolvency to me. Mm -hmm. It means that we've actually lent it out and we're not going to get it back until seven years. So you either have a seven year payment schedule or, or nothing, basically. So that's insolvency to me. They look at things like happening, like Snowden, for example, in America, and they say, this country's toast. If one guy in a computer can take down this frickin' country, I want my gold, I want it now. Mm. And so there's never been a point of greater vulnerability. So going forward, JP Morgan's eligible gold at the COMEX has plunged to just over one ton, or 46,000 ounces. Tell us about that. Yes, um, you, if, if you watch the, the, first of all, there are two classes of bullion in the COMEX repository, eligible and registered. Registered gold is, is what's held against outstanding futures for delivery, immediate delivery. So registered gold is what matters, and you look at that as a proportion of the total gold, and that's gone from about 70% in 2000 to under 16% as we speak at the moment. So basically... Um, they have no gold. <laughs> basically they have no gold. But that's yeah. what you're saying, no, another <laughs> supply of gold is tapped. They yeah. got no gold, they've been lacing it out, selling it out, and hoping that they would scare people. They didn't scare people. Uh, so they're the big boogeyman, Jamie Dimon. He didn't scare anybody, you freaking jack moron. Uh, so now you're gonna suffer. Good, I want to see him raked over the coals and like pour gasoline over the guy and just light him on fire. The flaming Jamie, beautiful. All right, now, uh, last year you're talking about the central banks are going to take back to the stone age with quantitative easing. Now, here's the question. Um, <clears throat> they mentioned tapering, markets crashed, they backed off. Mm -hmm. Ben Bernanke in his recent testimony said that, and I quote, uh, or a paraphrase, I should say. He said basically that if in fact <clears throat> we taper, if we ease off on the easing, the economy crashes, mm. is what he said. Mm. Um, yeah, I think that... Um, but, but last year, they said that, remember, in 15 minutes they could raise interest rates and there yeah. would be no problem. Yeah. This year he's saying if we raise interest rates, the economy crashes, according yeah. to Bernanke. So they can't... That tells me again that they're out of all their tricks. There's no more tricks they in are. the bag. They are, they are. There are no more tricks in the bag. There are no more tricks and in the bag. And people are buy, taking their gold delivery. And people are taking delivery and wanting to take delivery of their, uh, their gold. You see, the, all of these gold obligations, people were happy to keep in dollar terms because you could do the exchange. Okay, but they're ultimately gold obligations. They're not, they're only dollar, they're, people are only willing to hold them and exchange them against dollars because of the sanctity of a gold obligation, basically. Now, if that sanctity is... Is, is, is questioned in any way whatsoever, you know, there are going to be huge problems, huge problems. And Max, mm -hmm. they're going to dress it up as something else. Well, by problem, you mean okay. insolvency. N not only, Bank insolvency. I mean, uh, that aside, okay, whatever happens in the gold market, just like Nixon talked about the money speculators back in 71, causing <laughs> the gold market to, to collapse, they'll come up with some other kind of nonsense, you know, as to why the gold futures market isn't functioning. You know, people hoarding or, or whatever. You oh, know, you saw in Hungary, in Hungary last week, the, the, pr the prime minister blamed the bond uh, vigilantes for the country's uh, problems. Mm. So they're already vilifying the financiers, yeah. the bond vigilantes. So you're saying that once it becomes clear that the gold buyers are are causing massive bank failures, mm. they're going to attempt yeah. to vilify the heroic silver buyers, the silver liberation army, who we should hold in esteem 
Of course, these same central bankers will attempt to vilify them and scapegoat them. Yeah. But we need to remain strong against these charlatans in the central bank, the Larry Summers of the world. Absolutely. Okay, bond market, is it entered a secular period now of uh, rising interest rates? I don't think so. What? You have that to remember. goes against my theory. <laughs> Go ahead. You remember, you know, it's, it's like I compare it back to the assignats in France, okay? So they, they, they were launched with a 6% interest, but by the time they collapsed, okay, 6% interest in assignats, well, an assignat could be exchanged for, for nothing. You know, so, all right, yes. In nominal terms, interest rates might go up to 5% or 6%, you know. I only talk in nominal terms. Yeah, okay? but then On you have show, to think... On this show, we talk nominal terms. The, you're, the, you're talking the, for the, the real terms. The fiat system will never fail in its own terms because it doesn't need to fail in its own terms. You just said... We, we just said it. It's got... Sandeep. <laughs> We'll have to have you on back again. <laughs> but that's all the time we have today, so uh, thanks for being on the Kaiser Report. <laughs> thanks, folks. <laughs> Okay, and that's all the time we have for this episode of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Sandeep Jaitley. If you, if you can attend a lecture by Sandeep and Professor Faketa at the British Museum on the 5th and 6th of October, you're welcome to. For more details, go to their site, faketaresearch.com. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.